Jews in Romania, I mean, that has, oh, let there be light. Uh, that has to be such a cool sensation knowing that this fandom is global. I mean, people love it in every part of the world. What, what is that like for you guys knowing how big of a fandom there is? I, um, I didn't know these books, you know, I knew of them, I didn't, but I hadn't read them before the filming began, and one of the great joys for the last 20 years now has been meeting people who the books changed their lives, and now the films changed their lives, and the films, I think, are a very honest, genuine attempt to tell the books. They were created by well, people who loved them. Yeah. And they were rigid about it, too. You know, what, what we did had to be true to the... <laughs> had to be true to the books, and if we wanted to, to get an adjustment made, we would go to the, the writers and say, what about this? And they say, where is it in the books? And if it's there, you could do it. But, and so, that was Peter. He was, this, was his, this was his dream to do these films. He worked so hard to get them on too. He had to traipse around all over the world trying to get someone to, to finance them, and no one wanted to. And he finally went into New Line Cinema in uh, Los Angeles to see the, the pitch again. And uh, the fellow said to him, so you want to make one of these films? And he said, yes. Why don't you make all three of them? That's, what, right. that's how it came about, because they figured it would be cheaper to do it that way. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. It was the first trilogy, right, to be shot concurrently all in a row, correct? I, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And initially, it was, when it was with Miramax, it was uh, going to be two films. So they, they cut halfway through the two towers. And uh, that had never been the intention, but it was, you know, the bosses were saying this is what would be the fun. So when it all changed and, and New Line stepped in, then it truly became. And, and I think it, yeah, it is perfect as three films. It needs to be three films. Yeah. 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 yeah, for sure. And they were very supportive, weren't they? The whole. Yeah, they were amazing. Everyone supportive of it. But it deserved to be supported. And uh, Jackson just was on fire. He yeah. was well, on fire. Well, what was his style like as a director? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> well, I shouldn't do a character. <laughs> nah. It's just amongst us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, 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 look, he was, uh, he wore shorts in the middle of winter. In New Zealand, this is. I mean, it's crazy. He waddled a lot. And what, whatever you do something, he'd say, yeah, 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 do it again. <laughs> do it again. He kept, I didn't want to see. Anyway, I had to fall back. I had to fall backwards onto these stairs. And uh, so I did the actor actually thing, you know, protected myself going back. He said, no, 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 you look like an actor. <laughs> I said, okay. And uh, so then the, the art department, the sweethearts, they brought out some padding so I wouldn't hurt myself. And I thought, you get rid of the padding. Make it real. So I finally did. And 17 times, <laughs> because that was what he did, I was so bruised. <laughs> I took my pants off that night, as I often do. But, but I, I was out with the boys and I said to Billy Boy, have a look at this, and he took a photo of it. <laughs> and I've never seen that photo. I've never seen that photo. Somewhere on the internet. But it was out there, was it? Yeah, it was. One of those soft porn. Yes. Old guys porn something. Noble buttocks. Oh, yeah. It would be a best at M1 because I was so bruised, I tell you. Enough of that. Peter Jackson was on fire. He worked with a uh, cinematographer called Ian Leslie, who was in Australia. Uh, they were like Jordan and him. Jordan and him. Uh, the way they worked together. And uh, unfortunately, he died prematurely just recently, a couple of years ago. And I, I wondered how Peter would uh, survive without him. It's just amazing to watch the planning and the focus of one on And they sort of would know. Yeah. There, there were also there were moments when there was one day, I think, five different units were shooting. and. Sometimes you'll have a, with a film you'll often have a second unit, but that's usually a much smaller. These were full industrial, big budget movie units. So, so they were at the last day. It was on the last day. Five lots going all at once. Yep, the last day. And Peter would be in a tent with monitors all there, and he would be a, you know, talking here to via. And he had, they had their own satellite. New Line bought him a satellite, oh. and uh, <laughs> I think satellite time. But um, <laughs> but so he would. On a mountain, 300 miles away, people were filming in the snow, and he'd be like, yep, no, a bit over to the left, yep, move that, up. okay, right, no, no, let's have a look at that, rehearse that, yep, okay, set that up. Then he'd come here, and they'd be in studio, then he would rush into a studio beside him, then he'd pop his head out of the tent and go somewhere else, 
and he had all, but all through the film, he knew where every piece was going to fit well before it even became, you know, on celluloid. It was, he understood every beat of this film and every frame of this film, I think, before we even ever arrived in the mm -hmm. new They've done a storybook. Sometimes in Google television, they do a storybook, uh, an artist called Sketch Up the... What? 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 Sometimes in film, probably voice drop too. Very nice. <laughs> they do a storybook. And that, that's a sort of a guide for what shots they'll take. With the three films of, of Lord of the Rings, they had done this look, which was absolutely intense and accurate all the way. So the reference point was, as a matter of it was nine months into the shoot, and it I, yeah, I remember that. Okay, we'll do that. They had, had it planned, which is why it works so well. I was you, in there. You were in there. I did the voice. I played Frodo. I played Legolas. I played the Nazi. Did you? <laughs> they were in the film with me. They were the other ones. No, I, I never got to play Denisor. No, I bet you did. They left that. They said, to be played by John Mobile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, great. <laughs> but it was, we, we did that over, we first we shot the, uh, recorded the two films as a radio play, then we did the three, and it was the most fun, because we had no idea if they were going to be big films, we no. just thought, oh, Peter's making a kind of, he made slasher films before, and, and Heavenly Creatures. Heavenly Creatures are beautiful. And so we were, you know, we go, how does a Frodo talk? I'm going to be Frodo! And, <laughs> and but the Nazgul, this is, this is, the one thing I would, apart from being a Lego character because of this film, is the Nazgul sound, the yeah. set kind of sound. Basically, that I made that. <laughs> Fran, Fran claims that she did, and her scream is also in it, but that is my original scream mixed in with the, the Nazgul story. Thanks very much. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful story. Good night. <laughs> So, uh, John, you did mention that you filmed in New Zealand, and it is just so beautiful. Everything about these films is so just mm. exceptional to look at. Did you guys have a favorite filming location? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I worked uh, in Wellington in the studios there, uh, and, and in a big quarry a few miles north of there, which was Minas Tirith, but I didn't go to South Ireland. I did a little bit of dance and stuff. Did you? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's the most beautiful country. It's a tiny little place. The whole of the New Zealand population was involved in this film, it seemed to me. <laughs> they took it so personally. At one stage or other, they wanted a few horsemen to do a charge. And uh, they put We had hundreds and hundreds of people turning up from all over the islands with their, their horses in the back, ready to go. <laughs> and they were very undisciplined, too. They, just, they were terrific. But that's the way the New Zealanders. Wellington was turned over to us, wasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. turned over. I think at one point the, the, there is, uh, they needed sound effects of marching and the Urukai coming. Mm. And so someone, Peter probably just phoned the head of the army and said, um, can we have your guys? <laughs> and then he phoned a, a, a stadium and said, ah, can we have the stadium? And so all the New Zealand army just turned up in the stadium <laughs> and he got to be Mussolini and go, march, march, march. <laughs> and they recorded the entire New Zealand army doing, being Urukais. So don't pick on us because we'll send an Urukai when Australia invades. As if we'd bother. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, Australia is in a bit like Canada and uh, the United States. Oh, okay. They sort of sound a bit the same, but Australians are better. <laughs> we're politer. You were very quiet. Oh, yeah. yeah, but full of fury underneath that polite. Of course you are. <laughs> so, uh, good make great films. if it's okay with you guys, we're going to take some uh, questions from yes. the crowd. So, yes, I guess yes, just yes. put your hands in the air and we'll call you. Hands in the air. All right, let's go with this lady right here. Um, do you have any souvenirs from the filming? Like original souvenirs? I, I, the only thing I took was a pair of ears that I was given, and they are rotting and mouldering and festering, <laughs> quite possibly evolving somewhere. But I have no idea. <laughs> Sounds like a scene from Fringe. <laughs> we actually grew an ear once. Oh. No, I didn't take anything. I'm, I'm not a cricket. And, uh, or a thief. <laughs> I, uh, I, did, I did take a pair of sunglasses off a set once. I still think about that. <laughs> but Joshua Jackson's going, oh my eyes. My eyes. <laughs> uh, no, I, but a lot of people did. And uh, somehow or other, they, those belong to history, a lot of those things now. I mean, anything I would have taken, went on tour with the, the uh, 
in, in touring it on the, on the show. So there's nothing I wouldn't take it. Happening. I think it is it all. I think it's all in a museum in Los Angeles now. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. I know my swords there in my costume. <laughs> That's cool. There's a Our sweat is in a museum, John. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's a whole new Don't perspective. Before lunch. <laughs> yes. I love the Merry and Pippins. I love the, those two boys. Because they, they, they don't, they're sort of on the side of things. They're not running the main mission, but they, they are such the heart of, of what Little Hobbits are. They, are. they are the joyful, playful, naughty. And in a way for me, they are the thing that is being, the world is being saved for them to exist. And I love them for that. The Ring Saga. You know, everyone was tempted by the ring and the evil, and the, the, the job was to get rid of it. They couldn't trust any of the humanoids or the elves or anyone else. We're all corruptible. So they gave the simplest people yeah. in the universe. Mm -hmm. Give them a throw, though, because he's so pure. And I thought that was a great story. Mm -hmm. And how his friend Samwise came with him. Mm -hmm. I thought Sean Astor was fantastic yeah. in that. I really did. I thought he'd give the Captain Report. <coughs> Dear things. But there's a great legend in there, isn't it? A great story about uh, simplicity. Mm -hmm. Great philosophers and so forth have always said, you know, simplicity is the answer. You know, the God was raised or everything else, you know, simplicity is the answer. And you know, we had it and it struck me very strongly that he wasn't tempted, he did, it wasn't his nature. He couldn't have given it to Barham or Faramir or you or me. You know. <laughs> We'd give it to you, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> you were the obvious choice. <laughs> give Dennis all the ring, he's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could go wrong. <laughs> Who said that? I think Jennifer. No, I think it was probably some orcs reckon we'll get him now. Yeah. Give him the ring, he'll bugger it up. Uh, it's Jennifer on, on, on a chat thing going, I think Jennifer would be quite good. <laughs> Give him the ring. Who is this? Donna <laughs> The reimagining. Months I had to put up with him. <laughs> and years since. This is no uh, yeah, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to you next. Go ahead. Question for John. Can you tell us an unusual story about working with Ian McKellen? I can tell you this, that when I came into it, I was a stage actor, and Ian McKellen was like the, considered to be the best Shakespearean actor in the world, probably still is, and he was a legend, and he's also such an interesting fellow, so I was a bit in awe, perhaps, of working with him, uh, and he was, he, well, he's, he's fantastic person to work with. But I'll tell you a little story about his generosity. You know when we're doing films sometimes we there'll be a scene shot, a long shot, and then from someone's point of view and then it'll turn around the other point of view. I remember once we were filming up in Tirith and a parade up and down the street or something or other and I'd my character was there and I was watching Ian out of the window watching the parade. And then the, obviously when that all went past they turned the camera around and put on the and Ian McKellen was there in, in the back of He didn't have to. As just going through the of doing what I would do as a professional actor, which is supporting the other fella, he just stayed there. Someone said, well, you don't need to be here at present. He said, I oh, know John was here for me. I'm here for him. That's, the, that's, the, that's Ian McKellen. It's an extraordinary story, isn't it? I, I liked him a lot. He's a very smart fellow. He's very funny. Naughty. Naughty <laughs> one. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Gifted. I, I, it's a very long time ago. Um, the joy I had, not, not sort of specific time, but I would come and go. So I was up in, in Auckland, another city, doing a TV show. And so whenever they would say, come down, and sometimes it was you going down to shoot one day, but you would be there for two weeks because they'd change the schedule and so forth. So each time, I would go to generally a new place, sometimes it was the studios, but often it would be, you know, the forest down here, a lake here, or somewhere just gorgeous. And 
sort of check in with all the kids. So they they were schlepping through for two years, working working their little hobbit bums off, <laughs> and and so I would wander in and sort of be fresh and new and, and kind of catch up with them. So it was always a it was a lovely world to go back into and play, and and every time astounded by the detail of. I, I mean, a television show, which was great, but it's a TV show. You kind of, you know, you, you get through it fast. And then we get down into this world, and every prop you are given is the most beautiful, created work of art. The costumes are so exquisite. The, the detail of filming is, is so intense that that, to me, was just an absolute joy, plus the wonderful people that you get to. It was unheard of to, 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 for all of us to be affected to that degree, locked away down in a corner, really way down the bottom of the world. All of these people from all over the world. I remember going into one of the meetings, occasionally Peter Jackson would call a meeting of all the cast. We're all going to room. And I uh, remember John Reese Davies, <laughs> you know, the big doer of Welshman. He said, I want to say something. Yes, John. He said, This is the finest ensemble of actors I've ever worked with. <laughs> End. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember because he didn't say that many nice things. By the way, Phil, and I, I could recall this might be in secret, but in the whole process of Lord of the Rings, I, I can only remember one person being let go of, as it was. It was an actor who didn't want to do what we all had to do, to prepare, you know. And he said, oh, I don't have to do that, so he wasn't there next time. That's how, that's... Peter's attention to detail, though. You know, you had to be ready. And uh, speaking of, of great uh, stories, I'll come back to you. Remember what it is? I'll smack it myself. Don't come back to you. I'll take the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm recording. Okay, so the scene that you're like eating, was that the director <laughs> telling you to like eat like that, or did you just do that all on your own? <laughs> well, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's no. a whole new question for you. We were setting up this big scene, a uh, huge scene, and um, they. Yes, he whipped everywhere, we were getting ready, and the art department brought out a plate of flute, a food flute, food for me to, to, to eat during the scene. But of course, being film, you have to, there's a lot of shots, so you have to get it right every time for continuity purposes. I was sitting up there and I was going through the one, uh, down through D1, D3, D5, that's what I did. And at one stage, Jackson was looking through one of the many monitors and he saw me squirt a bit of uh, raspberry juice out of my face. And he came running out, one way out. One way out, very excited. He said, can you do that again? Can you do that again? And uh, he liked that bit. So I said, I think so. <laughs> so he stuck a tomato in there. And said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, what more again, you know. Uh, so that's, that's how that came to be. And of course, it was it turned out to be one of the high points of the show. It's, it's so gloriously greedy, too. Yeah. It's just like a, a need to own and assume it's fine. It's true, Craig, but what they also did in that glorious thing that it was, was then they, they put the soundtrack in there and they amplified the sound of crunching and everything, which I didn't do, I tell you. Uh, the whole thing was just amplified and then they went from that to the absolute mute, no sound for the, for the right away. Beautiful. Beautifully produced. Yeah. And I think, kind of piggybacking off of what you're saying, obviously every part of these films was 10 out of 10, including the sound people that came in to do the sound editing, and that's definitely something that should be uh, admired as well. It's just everyone, you know, from the sound to the costuming to the wigs were, and they were amazing. amazing. Yeah. The best of it, the wig. And then this, this is a very good one. I've read the story, sorry, give me a second. <laughs> Vigo Mortensen, of course, is uh, my favourite one. And I was the last principal on set because I was officially really only in the last film on set, third one. So I turned up there and they were all be there forever, it'll be me. And they couldn't find a trailer for me. They did, they did find one eventually. It was huge. It was a New Zealand paratroop. <laughs> it was huge. Bernard Hill was very jealous. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I measured it. Oh, yes. Why has he got that one? But anyway, I'm sitting here getting ready for this knock on the door, and I opened it up and there's in full costume was Vigo Mortensen outside my door. He said, Hello, John, I just wanted to walk you to the family. Aww. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a gesture to come yeah. and find me in the middle of all that. So my opinion of him was already very high and kept getting higher as the show went on. 
one wonderful actor, but also just a good human being. And I, I think very much the captain of that yep. film. Like, you you so. need a lead who who is a captain, because part of it is, is I don't know sport at all, but there is this sport team analogy of, of you need that person to turn up, to be on time. If they behave and they set the standard, then everyone else follows. And you go very much. Who said the standards all right? He used, to go, he used to go and sleep out in the forest. <laughs> really? <laughs> himself? Just to get acclimatised? <laughs> you know, thought cost you one. And, and all the ADs would be, he'd be like, hey, I'm, I'm just going to stay here tonight. So uh, so I'll be here in the morning. And they were like, oh, you I, do that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Morgan's. <laughs> <laughs> He's a rare being. He's also a, a poet and, and a writer. And he travelled, I mean, you may not see this, but he's, most of us will be travelling from a suitcase or something. Not bigger. He turned up, we were getting on a first class flight from somewhere to somewhere. And he took up the bag over his shoulder, no shoes on. That's the way he travelled. <laughs> and he had two assistants, both of whom were Argentinian over Berlin. So they spoke Spanish the whole time, because he's Danish. He's just a unique character. But he didn't go to any bother, just slung a bag over his arm. Oh, and one of those pillowcases things. No shoes. <laughs> <laughs> no shoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The gentleman over here. Yes. Hi. Um, Walter Bishop is one of the best characters that I've ever seen on television. And <laughs> I, was, I was just wondering what it was like seeing yourself in one of the early versions of the de-aging technology they used in that one episode. And also, is there any chance of seeing more Fringe in the future? The, the de-aging? Yeah, do you remember the episode where they actually de-aged oh, yeah, you? Yeah, and the, yeah it, was one, it was kind of an early use of that technology. I just always wondered what that felt like kind of being the guinea pig on that and how it felt seeing yourself in that episode. Um, it was very exciting to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Take a pill and you're youthful again. Uh, it was early stages. I've done a couple of other ones that, that are different. It's, it was really interesting. Um, and I could look at myself and say, no, you look like you've had it done. But the techniques were all very sound and came across all that. was in an episode called Peter, which was in episode was in uh, the first season, I believe. It was the only episode that uh, both Tyler Josh, Jack Florent and Torb were in. It was just, I was the only principal that was in it. Was it digital or was it... Um, no, that was before. We, we, we were still on 35mm uh, at that stage. We changed to digital. I don't know how much you're familiar with this, but it's a very different world. Uh, I think about end of season two. And uh, when, when you go to that, you have to, all, of the, all the lighting, all the visuals change. Digital. So the... the Director of photography had to change all the lighting set up and the makeup people had to do all this stuff. Can't get away with anything on digital. And we went through that transition. Everyone of course missed 35 mil, just sentimental, I suppose. But we all wanted to look like those washed out beautiful. Lovely. Those <laughs> <laughs> actors look so glorious because they were But there there is the sound of when you hear the sound of film going through oh. a camera. It's loud, it's like and it's the sound of money. So with digital, so you know, if you, you go, let's go again, let's go again, let's go again, you can, you can, but if you're hearing that, it's like, oh God, I'm costing them so much money, so much money. That's true. Yeah, they can but, worry about digital, does, let's do it again. It does sort of lift your, your readiness, I think. When it's on film, people, one of the things that has changed slightly is people often go, let's shoot the rehearsal, which I hate, because you all rehearse to get to the point where you are ready to present, I think. And, with film, that would happen because you it costs so much you didn't want to waste it. So it would be, let's all come together and then take one. But yeah, digital has its. I still do that. Um, I'm familiar with that shit in rehearsal because sometimes if it's a small scene, right? So only you and someone else, or, or something of that nature, then there's a, there's, there's a an energy that exists by the time you get to the set. And once you've done your camera blocking, which we have to do, is that also it's a rehearsal. But you know damn well I got it. Yeah, because it's ready, and so they, sometimes that's set up for them. We do the safety, but I don't mind that at all. You know, it's, a, it's a bad scene to be in when you're still fumbling around for your words or your character in rehearsal. It's not, <laughs> not a good look at all. Yes. Sorry. Um, having done television, film, stage, voiceover, what is your most challenging type of acting and your favorite medium to work in? Um, I, 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 I still find the most challenging thing I find is, is playing an American. Um, 
it, I, I, I get better, I get closer and closer to it, but I still find that there are other accents in the world I feel very comfortable in. America is, it, it's, it's still a, uh, difficult. Um, the, the, the place I love the most is when you're on a, in a television show and it's, it's you are a group and you're working and you get the pleasure of six months together or longer sometimes. And for me, it's, <clears throat> it's the carnival folk. It's you get to be part of a crew and a large dysfunctional family and you get to make a show that hopefully you all love and care about. And to me, that is the happiest, most joyful place to be. I, I concur there. I like television of its uh, things you've described there. And also, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit speedy, a bit ADD, so I don't get, get on with things. I love, I love the pace of it. You know, it's just it's so fast. And uh, there's not, no time to rehearse, really, usually. So they go, fuck it, let's do it. And uh, so it's always exciting. You get a spontaneity about it. And, and what you're talking about, there, the comradeship that exists and the little petty fights that go on sometimes. <laughs> not with people like us, but some others. <laughs> I like that, and it's, it, the, the process is so, is so astounding if you take time to think about how a show gets from a script coming in late, and they always come in late, you know, and you get this, and they get the revisions every day for it. You get that, and about two weeks later, you've finished the filming, you've done your bit, then it goes off to post-production, and these brilliant musicians and sound technicians and everything get working on it, and the whole thing's finished in about a month. It's, um, it's amazing to think about it, and how much... The, the sound engineers, and they, they used to get together a, a, a full orchestra to do to do each episode's uh, mm -hmm. music. You know, isn't that astounding to think about? Mm -hmm. A lot goes on behind the scenes, and brilliant people. Okay. All right, we, we have about five minutes left, so we've got time for a couple more questions. Let's start over here, and then we'll work our way that way. So what was your favorite role, Spartacus or the other, or Lord of the Rings? I am enormously grateful and honored to have been part of Lord of the Rings, but it, I was, a, a brief visitation. Um, Spartacus was, as we talked about, was a, a family and a, a series that I really got to play in, and, it's, and so I adored that. How did it go when Andy died? Yeah. It was he had he had stepped away for treatment, and so they then gone back and shot and said, "Please find a way to carry on, so you know people can pay their mortgages." And so they had shot the prequel, and he was going to come back. And then Chloe, one of the producers, towards the end of that, called us all, and and he was sick again and not coming back. So he was such a he was a, a true captain. So that first season, he he set a level which the show would never have of the show would have been a piece of trash, I think, without him. And I, and I mean no disrespect to the other actors in it, but those kind of shows can easily veer off into sort of parody, and and he just had such a beautiful, beautiful quality to him. Um, and he genuinely was a really nice guy. Yeah. So I I know, you know, the, the crew and the people who knew him and worked with him, it was devastating. But his, when he was sick, he was so adamant that he wanted them to find a way to, to keep the show going. Because this was his family too, and he wanted them to continue making the show. And he was very supportive of the casting process to find a new Spartacus. So. He was a student of mine, I'm very awesome. proud to say. Wow. Yeah. He was beautiful, right? just this he was, remarkable... He was. It started yeah. off, this is uh, the play Spartacus, it's, he had been a top model in Three Hands, and, and uh, he decided he wanted to do some acting. It doesn't always work when people do that. <laughs> but it did for him, by God, he worked hard. He was one of the best, most de devoted yeah. students I've ever had. I'm so proud of him when he got started this bit. Um, I, 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 I had said something was going on and I went back to Australia and I got them to bed. My daughter told me he was sick. So we met and had a coffee and turned up and he said, Howie Davis, and I'm looking really cool. <laughs> this man was dying of cancer. He told me about his optimism going up to Bali to get the next bed. What? Left the family behind. Anyway, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know there was, okay, this gentleman right here. If you had to pick from all the Lord of the Rings cast, who is your best friend? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you mean in, in real life? In oh, real life? Oh, oh great. <laughs> 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 oh, I don't know. Oh. Uh, the, the, 
was it was like it's great. It was a, it was like a big family. I was probably closer to the uh, to the hobbits <laughs> than, than anyone else. You know, we used to go out on the evening sometimes. Like, the naughty hobbits. <laughs> 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 and Orlando was a bit naughty in those days too. <laughs> the good old days. Did, did you yeah. answer? Okay, they're besties. <laughs> <laughs> With the blue hair. Yeah. Wait, a question for Craig. You were talking about working on a TV show. I hope you were meaning Legend of the Seeker. Yes, I was. <laughs> okay, my question is, do you wish there would have been another season to wrap up the story, or were you relieved it was over? I don't, I don't care about wrapping up the story. I just would have loved another season to play and, and um, wear the wig. It was... Um, <laughs> It, yeah, it was, it was, that was a lovely, it was a silly, fun show that we just had it. Did you play on, did you play on Legend of the Seeker? Um, <laughs> good escape. Um, no, it was, it was a great, silly, fun show, but, but it was, yeah, it just, it just was at a time where it was too expensive, and it wasn't syndic, I don't know how it worked, but it, it was so random where it played over here that it never kind of was sellable, but you, know, you always want another season. Usually, usually I do, but uh, there's some actors who can't wait to get out. It's the same, it's, it's just amazing. You get, you get cast in a play, for example. You desperately wanted to do this. And, and you've got cast, you wouldn't even sack you. Well, then I'm about a week. But the actors are like, well, this will never be ended, you know? Only, uh, only three months to go. Oh. <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> for the pain is to do it. And you're oh, God, I can't stand it. Moaning, moaning. Oh, oh. Dreadful. Yeah. Yes. I think we had one more question over here. Yes. Okay. What do you get thoughts on the Power Show? Collective gasp. I don't uh, think about it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't think about it because I, when, when we did Ring, it was almost like that was the picture mm -hmm. of, of everything that Tolkien tried to express. So when people actually said to me, would you be interested in doing another one uh, for the Hobbit? I thought I could have been. I said, oh, no, no that, that, I want to hold on to that. For me, I want to hold on to that idea. So I haven't really followed the other one. Yeah, it's just about to open or it has it open. Yeah, it's just about to open. Too much to close her up. Too much to close her up. The clips I've seen, I, I think it looks utterly beautiful. And, it, and I think they have... They have They've painted the world. The world feels very similar visually. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think it looks great. I also, I was talking to someone earlier today that watch it and then make a decision. I, there, there, is, there is a tendency of, of internet, which does kind of break my heart, of like piling on stuff before it even happens. It's like, just give it a chance, watch it. And, mm -hmm. and the story belongs to everyone. It was put out, was it? 1800 years ago, um, and, and you know, and, and people hated Peter for doing it. There was they were jumping on him at the beginning. It's let them tell their story, and and you might not like it, but there's going to be people who fall in love with it in a way that you fell in love with rings. So, it, and I'm, I promise you, I'm not working for Amazon, but <laughs> yes, a whole lot of like a vast amount of people put their their hearts and, and love and time into this thing. So, I, I want to watch it and make a choice rather than having a strong opinion before I know anything about it. So. I think that was our, oh, okay, let's ask final question. Go ahead. Yeah. It was a weird to say, I don't know if you know Legends of Tomorrow, but uh, mm -hmm. I was doing the voice of Moloch, that'd be bad. And at one stage or other, though, there's something that happened within the story, and I'm trying to work out whose voice that was. And one of the cast members was watching Lord of the Rings. He said, that's, that's that voice there. <laughs> so they, they, they recognized the voice as the same stentor, so they did a quick look back in time, and they found me on the set, me, on the set in New Zealand, as an Australian, but dressed up, you know. Uh, I wasn't even very sophisticated. <laughs> and they came along and said to me, well, we keep watching do this, these extra lines, some reason or other. I don't think I'm carrying on. Oh, bloody Peter wouldn't want me to do that crap. I, this is gone much sadly because I got it. <laughs> and uh, oh, all right, give it a go. And uh, so I, I did it. And uh, that was called, the episode was called 
started your mobile. It's the weirdest position. Uh, but it was, it was great fun. And the crew, I knew the crew, all the crew for years of working up there. So it was fun to be back there again. But it's weird to think you I'm downloading that this evening. Right? Oh, <laughs> ripping that out of the internet. I had a few other gangs that wouldn't let me do them either. I had a few others up my sleeve there. So were you, was, did the, the Big Bad Evil possess you, or were you, John Noble, the Big Bad Evil? No, I was, I was then thought, had a voice similar to whatever I was trying to copy. They worked it out anyway. Ah, Peter wouldn't want that. Let <laughs> <laughs> it go. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Great question. Uh, but oh, we'll but by the way, they the costume beautifully, I have to say that. I was going to say, before we wrap it up, do you guys have any final thoughts for this afternoon? Thank you for coming. It's a joy. <laughs> to I, I agree with Brian. It's actually lovely to do it with you too, mate. But I must say, I didn't think it would be. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a, for me, it's always a pleasure to, to talk to people that are observing our work. <clears throat> believe it or not. Particularly film and television, you don't get any feedback. It's not like doing stage. You just work in isolation. So to come to this and see that this is going out for real people, for real stories, I always find uh, very, very rewarding. So thank you for being here for us. Thank you. And one time, everybody, for time over. Thank you.